Hi, I'm Francesca Nofrio, and I'm sitting down here with Eric Meyer, who is the current publisher of the Marion County Record and is accepting the 2024 William Allen White Award National Citation Award on behalf of the newspaper. Eric, it's Hi. great to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you. Well, welcome back to KUJ School. Yeah, this was uh, not far from where my office as editor of the Kansan was. Uh, they, they used to be right over there. We had a nice window onto the quad so that we could escape if need be. Uh. <laughs> awesome. So, seems that your role as newspaper publisher and editor has come full circle in your life. Well, yeah, th this is actually my retirement gig. I, I, I worked for two decades basically at the Milwaukee Journal and then taught for two decades basically at the University of Illinois and decided I was going to retire to this little weekly newspaper that I helped buy 25 years ago to prevent from becoming uh, chain owned because I'm a big believer in the fact that journalists need to have a stake in their community and the reason you do journalism is to support the community you come from not because it fits into some corporate master strategy somewhere. A hundred percent. So I know you mentioned that uh, you had bought the newspaper with your parents. So what does this newspaper mean to you? Well, and your family. I, start, I started working at the newspaper when I was in fifth grade. Uh, I was writing stories when I was in seventh grade. I, I, was, I was in charge of the place when my parents left when I was in high school. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a place that I've worked for, my mother and father have worked for, my grandmother worked for it before that. Uh, she, she actually retired from the Wichita Eagle and then came up, kind of did what I'm doing as a retirement gig working for the Marion County Record. Uh, she actually was a friend of William Allen White's, so worked for him for a while. Wow, small world. Yeah. Small world. So can you give us a little bit of insight on what it's like to be a publisher for a smaller newspaper? Well, the challenges are obviously there. And, and we keep getting told all the time that journalism's dying, it's dead, it's whatever else. And everybody's looking for these wonderful silver bullets to save it. And they don't exist. Uh, we've been told for decades that when my father was here in 1948, he was told that new, journalism wouldn't exist within 10 years. It would be replaced by facsimile. Everybody would have a little fax machine in their house and they'd get their news off their fax machine. Uh, you know, after that, it was the, the television nightly news, then it was the cable news networks, then it was the web, then it was social media and mobile media, and you know, now it'll probably be artificial intelligence or whatever else. Uh, something's going to replace us at all times. And the problem is, we're necessary. We are necessary for democracy to work. And some of the problems that we have right now with democracy not working quite as well as we might hope it would uh, are because journalism's not been doing its job well enough. Well, that leads me to my next question about journalism in general, but specifically, you know, in the days leading up to the raid and beforehand, what questions were you asking that ultimately led to the raid? We were challenging things that were, that were happening that people in positions of power didn't like us to raise questions. You know, this was Pleasantville. We were in black and white without Reese Witherspoon, but <laughs> we, were, we were there in black and white and, and we were trying to edge it, getting a little color into it once in a while. And they didn't like that. So they kept getting more and more bullying on us and as usually happens with bullying, they go that one step too far when they do something that becomes so much of an outrage that people won't put up with it. And that's what they did when they raided our offices. Unprecedented raid. Hadn't happened in decades in the United States. And it was shock to the world. I had the privilege of talking a week or so ago with Maria Ressa, the Pulitzer, the, Pulitzer, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from Manila, who'd been following our story from the Philippines in real time. She talked about what she did the first day that she heard it. Then she, my mother, who protested the raid, died the next day. And she talked about how she, she was completely sad the next day. And her reaction to this was, we and the rest of the world look to the United States to not have this kind of crap happen in it. And when it's happening in the United States, it's disheartening to the rest of the world. Our, their, their beacon of example for democracy working has gone dark. And so she was very concerned about it. And 
She's a great person, by the way. And uh, it's kind of cool to meet a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, and it, is, it does show, though, the importance of how people come to the aid. When, when they were raiding our newsroom, I told them that what they were doing was illegal, which, by the way, you, you should always do when the police are doing it. Don't fight them, but tell them that they're doing something wrong. Uh, but, uh, and they laughed when I said, you know, you guys are going to be on the front page of the New York Times. You guys are going to have a multi-million dollar lawsuit filed against you. Oh, yeah, sure. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, well, they did. Tens of thousands of people came out to support us. Marion, Kansas is the 122nd largest town in Kansas. 122nd. Marion County is the 37th largest county in Kansas. As of today, the Marion County record has the 8th largest paid circulation in the state. Because one of the ways people supported us was by subscribing. Now, this in and of itself caused some problems as our circulation manager who will be here this afternoon would be able to tell you because we weren't equipped to handle all these people coming in. But the people were amazingly supportive. Other news organizations were amazingly supportive. And as a lesson to students that are afraid, you know, well, this sounds okay, but I don't want to have people raid my house. Don't worry about it. If you're right, there'll be defense coming. And it came in great measure. Uh, yes, we've had, we're suing. And you can sue with a with contingency basis, so the lawyer will take the case and don't charge you anything. But our defense before that, because we're technically still under investigation. Uh, so far, the legal bills for that are $180,000. Uh, now, we fortunately had a libel insurance policy that paid off on it. Uh, the company was even surprised. The company that wrote the insurance, they said, we didn't know it, but we have a little client line in here that if your office is raided, that we'll pay for the defense on it. They said, we've never in the history of our company ever had to pay on this, but it's in our policy, so we'll pay. They, there was a 20% copay that we had to pay, and the Society of Professional Journalists has paid that. So we haven't had any cost to do it. And the response from other media have been overwhelming. If it hadn't been for those people calling attention to the raid, nothing would have happened. The bullying would have gone on. But journalism came to the rescue us, and people did. And the people are the really interesting thing. We received literally tens of thousands of emails. Not one of them was negative. Not one. And they were from all over the political spectrum. I remember leafing through them, and you know, next, next, next through them. And one of them came up and said, I'll bet those people who did that to you, they were a bunch of damn Democrats. And I princed and asked him, I'll bet those people who did that to you, they were a bunch of damn Republicans. Uh, and it was kind of like that. And the one thing that was really interesting was, disproportionately we heard from people in law enforcement about how awful it was. They are in a job that, you know, law enforcement doesn't have the best reputation right now, but there's a lot of good people in it. Uh, and they didn't like the fact that this was yet another way that the reputation of law enforcement was being sullied. Going off of that, well, first I want to say I am sorry for the loss of your mother. Um, Thank you. But coming out of this, how do you think, um, with all the support from the public and from other journalists and newspapers and newsrooms, how do you think that freedom of the press and freedom of the speech has really been brought to light? It's been brought to light and a lot of people say, well, what laws and changes in laws we need? We don't need to change any laws. We just need to enforce the ones we have, and we need to be resolved to do it. Uh, with journalism changing as much as it is, we have a lot of people who are working in journalism who aren't very experienced at it. They don't have this background that knows that somebody's going to come to your defense. There are things that are right and wrong, and you shouldn't take being bullied. We are the, the guardians of democracy, and, you know, Guardians are guards, and they're supposed to be intimidating in some regard. They're not necessarily going to be liked. Uh, we're not going to be beloved by everybody. My father had a famous favorite saying that, show me a beloved newspaper man, and I'll show you a shitty newspaper. Uh, and we, we will always expose things that somebody doesn't want exposed, but it's necessary. And the impediments that people put up to you that say, we want Pleasantville to stay in black and white. 
We don't want anything negative. Uh, those things you really have to fight past. And if you do, there will be people coming to your aid. And those people will include professional organizations and average citizens who really, you know, democracy is still alive and well. It's just kind of hibernating. 100% my final question. What can future journalists and aspiring journalists, especially here in the J School, what can they learn from this ever-changing landscape? Go out and do journalism. It's important and do it anywhere. Don't go out and become a social media influencer. That's not journalism. Don't go out and be a party planner. Go out and tell the people in society the truth about what's going on in the world. And be a Jeffersonian with this. You know, I, I've told you all the facts. Society's gonna make up its mind. Might not make it up the same way you would make it up. But as long as they have all the information and you're the people responsible for giving them that information, because government isn't gonna do it. Government's gonna say, government knows best. Big brother, listen to us. We're going to cocoon around this message, the echo chambers of social media. The other thing, I would think we would be much better off if everybody just took social media and threw it away completely. Get rid of it. It is a cocoon people can live in where they can be insulated from truth. And just hear the same slogans over and over again. We need to get past that. So. Don't figure out what your social media strategy is going to be. Figure out what your journalism strategy is going to be and let social media react on its own. Thank you for that piece of advice. We appreciate it. Sure. That's all the time that we have. I really appreciate you sitting down and speaking with me today. Thank you. Appreciate being here.